From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Dan O'Brien will share his latest price probability projection for corn based on the USDA's new world grain supply and demand numbers. And he'll comment further on the market impact of wheat feeding to cattle. That's part of Dan's remarks on the grain market trends this week. Also in today, K-State's Mike Stom taking a look at the condition of the current canola crop in Kansas. And Mike will go over the recommendations for top dressing fertilizer on canola in the coming weeks, emphasizing not only nitrogen, but other nutrients as well. And later to tackle the subject of our current stint in the deep freeze, K-State's Mary Knapp on Kansas agricultural weather. All this and more next here on Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome once more. The grain markets are our first order of business, as usual, on our Friday edition. Standing by once more, grain market economist Dan O'Brien, K-State Research and Extension. Dan, the market's an interesting last 48 hours or so on the heels of that USDA World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report on Tuesday. They took a hit the day after, but have since bounced back, at least moderately so. Yes, almost no changes for wheat, for corn, minor changes, nothing major in terms of, of the supply and demand balance sheet. And look, pulling that up right here to look look at what they had done for corn, really just an increase of 50 million bushels for projected exports. And if the market is disappointed in anything in these reports, it's that by their estimation, they think there's probably more usage for for corn and for soybeans. So those numbers generally were responded to in kind of a meh uh, sort of a response. But you'll notice it didn't really change a whole lot in terms of uh, where the markets have ultimately in- ended up a couple of days thereafter. What I think this does, it, it sets us up for the upcoming USDA Outlook Conference that will be uh, here, I think it's about 18th, 19th or so of February. The big issue coming out of there will be the acreage estimates of what the USDA will will be looking at. And for corn, uh, we put together some numbers trying to look at, say, 2% increase in acres, a 4% increase in acres. There was a kind of a a noteworthy farmer-based survey uh, online course uh, that came out last week said 4% increase. Well, we may get a 4% increase, maybe not. One thing that's, that's been hopping in response to that has been crop input prices, fertilizer, really moving to the higher side. So again, we talked about that change for corn, for for soybeans, they raised the export projection by 20 million bushels, I believe. Uh, and, and again, that's that's almost a tepid foot in the water. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think out of this uh, that it general idea is that the USDA is is taking a cautious approach on its numbers. Uh, they'll they'll let the actual performance come in and, and drive where their supply demand balance sheets end up at. It really is just so interesting to me that our complete focus, almost complete focus, is on on the export side. And for corn, we're not looking much at feeding, uh, not talking very much about ethanol usage. Uh, for soybeans, we're not talking a lot about crush, although if we do go up much more for exports, and well, you're tight enough on stocks that you're really getting down to to the grimy details and the real battle between who, who gets those last few bushels. If we're, if they're out there, and no doubt they are in places, but man, they're tightly held now at these prices. Look what's been happening in the futures markets. Mm-hmm. This this week, we've tried to look at, at the volume and open interest in the lead contracts for corn and for soybean futures. And uh, an interesting thing happened. It, it looks like within the last, well, last several days, basically since Friday, that the uh, contract 
positions that the volume and especially the open interest is beginning to roll to the May contract. Now, so that's going to happen naturally as we get to the end of the month, we'll be rolling over to the May contract. But it seems early to be doing that and still substantial volumes in the markets. But if you look at both corn and soybeans, you have more uh, open interest in the May contract right now than you have in the March contract for both those commodities. And uh, it seems early. But some of the down, downside price movement that we've seen in the last several days would be consistent with people getting out of very optimistic long positions, rolling out of that they'd have to sell to get out of them, and then moving on, on into the next contract if they're, if they're going to stay long. So that combined with the CFTC position data shows that, gracious, a whole bunch of people that are commercial hedgers – have short positions in the futures, record short. Well, record, when I say record, at least the data I can see back to 2006. So for corn, strong, strong hedging of, of needs for grain. On the long side, on the speculative side of things, pretty strong long position, but not, but it's got up to a certain point and is not going any further. So, so what takes it further? Well, strong buying and probably confirmation from these stocks reports that are that are coming out at the end of March. And throw one more issue into play. If we talk about stocks reports, the question we're going to have is how much wheat feeding have we had mm-hmm. given high price corn? And you're tracking the local trends on that here in Kansas again. Especially out, out where we have the feedlots at, out in western Kansas. Looking at prices in Garden City and in Colby, the wheat to corn price ratio, the cash wheat corn price ratio in, in uh, Colby at, well, the, it's the highest price amongst several bids, highest prices for corn and wheat, basically have a ratio of 105, 105%. For Garden City, it's 101. They're almost level. So gosh, that's indicative of, of an incentive to feed wheat. And you know, and given how tight things are uh, with a bunch of users trying to grab all this stuff, uh, you've got a lot of incentive to see that happen. And gee whiz, the price sure seems to be following that. Throw one more thing in, Eric. You and I were talking before we came on the air. What does cold weather do right. to, to livestock feeding for corn? And if corn's tight for wheat, we may be feeding some grain sorghum, but given the strength of basis, you'd think that it's most almost all going to export. So it's a, it's a wheat versus corn deal out in these livestock feeding areas if we're tight on corn. You just really do wonder wonder how much wheat we'll see being fed. And so we're going to come back to something we'd mentioned earlier. So the USDA had reduced its forecast of hard red winter wheat feeding in the United States in this last report by 25 million bushels. I just would not be surprised that we see all of that and probably more increase in uh, hard red winter wheat feeding that's gone on out out, out in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to see how that works out. So we see a 25 million bushel decrease in hard red winter wheat exports, and it's probably being gobbled up and more by an increase in hard red winter wheat feeding. Dan, you've taken the occasion this week as part of your notes on the markets to work up your latest price probability projections, this time for corn. This gets back to the likely acreage being planted to corn this spring and some other variables, presumably, as well. As we'd mentioned, uh, We'll have information coming out as probably the marker to start with uh, in a couple of weeks from the uh, from the USDA from the Outlook Conference. But if you look at at a say a two percent increase in corn planted acres, you'd go from uh, ninety point eight million acres planted last year for the crop we're now marketing, go up two percent. You're at ninety two point six. Also this year, if you go up say four percent, and the recent uh, surveys have come out, farmer surveys online from some pretty well-known sources, they, they're saying more like four. So plug in those numbers to get the average yield of the last five years, which is 173 bushels per acre. You've got about 14.7 to 15 billion bushels worth of crop. Now, a uh, stronger run on usage, uh, short crop, drought, nothing of that's in there. We're just saying give us average yields, and you end up with the difference between 4% and 2%, and by my calculations, is about 50 cents a bushel. Ending stocks, about uh, 1.585 billion bushels for 2% increase. Everything following through. Uh, ending stocks, about 1.8, 1.9. And uh, if you look at where historically that's put us for prices with uh, those type of, of stocks and stocks to uses, the difference between 420 at 2% and about 370 at 4%. So 
a price differential that's nothing to sneeze at, that's right. for sure. Right. And again, you can have a glance at those precise numbers in the notes that he has posted on agmanager.info this week. Strong week for soybean exports again. Let's address that and note how much underpinning that's continuing to provide to that soybean trade, Dad. For the week ending February the 4th, actual shipments of about 81 million bushels and with all purchases, both both shipments and forward purchases accounted for, you've got about 2 billion bushels of, of both action and promise <laughs> for exports. USDA projected that number to be 2.185 in terms of activity. The projection now is 2.25. So we're 97% of the way there. That number is a great number, but still at risk. If the South American crop comes in, it's not damaged, you could see some of those sales be canceled. That's a possibility, although less likelihood of, of that probably this year than in other years, just because of the thirst for soybeans around the world, and particularly China. So uh, strong forward purchases. Uh, again, prices on yesterday's market on the March contract, 1367 and a half. I mean, unbelievably <laughs> great prices. It is noteworthy. Uh, the, the next commodity we, we need to talk about it would be uh, expectations for fall soybean prices. If you look at March at 1367 and a quarter on yesterday's close, uh, November new crop, 1174, about a, a dollar ninety, dollar ninety five drop. So there's anticipation of of a fair amount of U.S. soybeans planted in that that prices would go lower in the summers down into fall. But we'll have to see. There's a lot of uncertainty and, and crop risk that will, have, that will happen before we get to that actuality. Well, guessing here that likely soon you'll be assembling your price probability projections for soybeans based on all yep. of this that's going on. And we'll look for that and visit with you next week right here. Dan, thanks as always. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Our weekly glance to the grain market trends. Dan O'Brien is a grain market economist with K-State Research and Extension based in Colby, northwest Kansas. And we'll return in a moment on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Agriculture Today continues now with an update on canola. In Kansas, how that crop is bearing up so far in this midwinter stretch. And we'll talk as well about nutrient management for that crop and the viability of top dressing, nitrogen, and other nutrients as we get closer to springtime. Mike Stom is with us, canola agronomist with K State Research and Extension. Well, Mike, you note that the gyrations in temperatures of late and then into the deep freeze isn't necessarily kind to canola. Yeah, there's both a positive and a negative to those fluctuating temperatures. You know, prior to really going into the deep freeze here, we were having above normal temperatures for the, the winter. And so the crop really hadn't gone completely dormant just yet. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. The crop is still somewhat actively growing, but at a very reduced rate. Uh, when you have those fluctuating temperatures. And it's typically in those years where we have the above normal temperatures where we can see some pretty significant yield potential in the spring, just because the crop doesn't have to recover so much from all the leaf area loss that we have sometimes when we have those really cold winters. Winter kill, though, has always been a worry with this crop. So as we've seen these persistent temperatures below freezing, for a few days in a row now and more of it to come. What does that portend for the crop, Mike? It's going to be really interesting and we're just going to have to ride it out like everybody else when it comes to evaluating the effects of the cold on on canola. We do know that the duration of the cold can be just as detrimental as the absolute low temperature. So these repeated nights of below zero temperatures and days where we, you know, don't get out of the the single digits, uh, we know that can have a, a detrimental effect on the crop. 
you know, we were fortunate that the crop did look good going into this period. Uh, so hopefully that will help. And then we do know that some areas have a little bit of snow cover, and that can certainly help to blanket the crop. That that's not the case uh, everywhere. Uh, fortunately, in the areas where most of the canola acres are in the state, we haven't actually entered the drought <laughs> just yet. Soil moisture conditions are, are pretty good. And so having some soil moisture is better than having really dry soils when we have these cold temperatures. So uh, there are some things that are going in our favor to help us get through. I might also add that uh, winter hardiness has improved in our cultivars. And so that's certainly a big benefit. Uh, you got to have those varieties that are able to withstand these temperatures. And, and we've, we've had uh, some colder weather recently, you know, not the duration that we're having now, but we've had cold temperatures over the, the last few growing seasons where we've been able to evaluate uh, some winter hardiness. And, and certainly the top commercial products uh, are showing good winter survival characteristics for our region. Good to hear. But that moisture availability will remain pivotal as we get out of the winter season and ease into spring. Concerns about the forecast. This crop will need a, another good drink sooner or later. Yeah, just like uh, the wheat's going to need uh, some help greening up this spring, canola is certainly going to need that uh, as well. You know, the benefit of canola having that, that taproot is, is big because uh, you can kind of mine a little bit more deeply than what a, maybe a wheat root system can get to in the soil with, with canola. And so we can maybe draw up uh, some of that moisture that's a little bit lower in the soil profile. Uh, but for sure, uh, some warmer temperatures and, and more moisture this spring are going to help. Well, to the other side of our conversation here and looking at nutrient top dressing right around this time of the year, of course, with the fields frozen right now, it would be ill-advised to cross the fields at this point. But when that opportunity does arise here in the next uh, couple of weeks or so, you would recommend growers think about their top dressing applications? Absolutely. It's going to be a critical time here once uh, temperatures do warm and we start to see uh, the crop green up and eventually bolt because it's it's right before the bolting period when canola has its peak nitrogen demand. So we, we need that nutrient there and available for the crop. And I think the nitrogen application is going to be extremely important this year because, like I said earlier, the crop really hadn't gone dormant yet. And so we were act we've actually been using some nitrogen over over the winter months. And a result of that is uh, we've actually seen some quite a bit of purpling in the, the crop over winter. And some purpling is, uh, is natural uh, with the overwintering process in canola. But I think some of the purpling that we've seen this year is actually a, a lack of nitrogen. And so the purpling that we talk about is just anthocyanin buildup in the, the leaf tissue. And that can be caused by any number of stresses. We've seen it caused before by, by water logging in the soils. And actually these fluctuations in temperatures can cause stress on the crop. And so that can cause the plant purpling as well. But I, th I think some of it also is just nitrogen driven and that the crop is just a little bit nitrogen starved. And so the spring top dress should help alleviate some of that that purpling that we're we're seeing. So you've got the demand that's going to be happening here once the crop bolts, and then I think we're just a little bit uh, starved on that nutrient. Some specifics here then, Mike, in as far as N rates to go with here, forms of N to utilize, thoughts on those? Yeah, forms are pretty open right now. I mean, we can use either a dry or a liquid product uh, to top dress the crop, and it kind of comes down to the producer's preference on whether they want to stream it on or whether they want to just broadcast uh, that in. Uh, we like to see about two-thirds of the plant's uh, demand uh, here in the spring. And my, you know, just a kind of a rough estimate of what I tell growers to, to have available, you know, if they're shooting for a 2,000-pound crop, they really need to have 100 pounds of N available throughout the season. So, you know, if you're doing two-thirds of that, 60 pounds now in the spring or, or more is certainly where they, they want to start. The focus is almost always on nitrogen when we're talking about top dressing canola or wheat, for that matter, Mike. But you say that other elements might be considered likewise, and sulfur is one of those. Yeah, sulfur is a really important element for canola because it's a, it's a heavy user of sulfur because of the sulfur-containing proteins in the seed. And so 
we need to make sure that uh, there's enough sulfur available. And kind of our rule of thumb is a minimum of 20 pounds of sulfur available for the crop. You've heard other agronomists come on on the radio program here and talk about how sulfur deficiency is is kind of showing up in some of our other crops, particularly wheat, uh, now because of the use of the low sulfur diesel, and we're just not getting as much back from the the environment. Well, it's it's doubly important, I think, in in canola, and I've seen the the effects of low sulfur fertility on canola, and it it's not a pretty picture. So you you definitely want to be aware and have some sulfur available for at the crop. And as with nitrogen, sulfur should be on the stand before it starts to bolt, by all means. Yeah, you can do uh, the sulfur at the same time as, as nitrogen. That's not a problem. We just want to make sure that we're not putting out elemental sulfur now because it has to oxidize for it to be plant available. And so we definitely want to have a, a plant available form of sulfur out there now. And another consideration, boron as a top dress application? Yeah, so boron is probably the most important micronutrient uh, for canola. There are some physiological processes that the plant relies on boron for, and so uh, we don't want to be deficient in that. And and typically our soils in Kansas aren't deficient in boron, but if you soil tested and, and found that your boron levels were low, you certainly want to have boron available, but also need to remember that the rates are really low for that. We're talking about a pound of boron or less per acre. If you do too much, it can be toxic to the plant. So you're kind of walking a, a fine line there, but it, it's certainly an important micronutrient for the crop. And generally for nitrogen, for sulfur, for boron, the question comes up, broadcast the products, band the products. Does it matter which application method one uses? I really think it kind of comes down to the preference of the, the applicator it may come to a point this spring where we got to get all this work done and, and you don't have a choice. You just got to get it on. And, and I think that's probably the most Im- important thing. And we, we really haven't researched, you know, whether banding or broadcast is, is better or one is better than the other. So I think the most important and the key thing is to, to make sure those nutrients are available when they're, they're needed. But both methods of application are successful. So producers can certainly choose the one that they prefer to to get the work done. Very well. Well, once more, there is an article in the recent Agronomy e-Update newsletter on canola top dressing. As part of that, you have a handy chart on nitrogen fertilizer needs for canola uh, related to yield potential and the soil test nitrogen levels in a field, and that's good information for producers to reference. They can see that at agronomy.ksu.edu. Well, Mike, we're hoping our canola stands in Kansas come through in fine shape once we get out of this deep, cold weather, and we shall see what happens. And we'll talk with you again then on down the line about how the crop is doing at that point. Appreciate your time right here. Thank you, Eric. Mike Stom with us, canola agronomist with K-State Research and Extension, and this is Agriculture Today. Now, this break. When we come back, today's agricultural news headlines are coming your way, along with this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop and Mary Knapp on Kansas Agricultural Weather. Stay with us here on the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here, and now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. Federal Reserve Banks, covering a swath of the country stretching from Montana to Indiana, report strengthening land values and improving credit conditions, although the Kansas City and Chicago branches, both mentioned regions that rely more heavily on cattle production, aren't seeing the same boom that's occurring in crop regions. The Fed in Chicago noted in its quarterly letter that agricultural land values increased 6% last year, the largest gain since 2012. 
well. Its survey of bankers found that 58 percent think that land values will continue to rise at least through March. 42 percent expect them to be stable. None said that they anticipate land values to decline. Now, the Kansas City Fed encompasses all of Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Wyoming, as well as parts of Missouri and New Mexico. The value of all types of agricultural land in the Fed district increasing by an average of 4% compared to the prior year, the highest average quarterly increase since 2014. That outlook is more notably optimistic than in recent years, with less than 15% of bankers anticipating non-irrigated cropland values to decline in the next year, more than 40% see prices increasing. Increases in commodity prices at the end of last year and robust support from government payments boosted economic conditions in the agricultural sector in the fourth quarter. That's according to Nathan Kaufman, the vice president of the Kansas City Fed, and Ty Creetman, assistant economist, in their post. They went on to say a majority of bankers in the Kansas City district indicated that farm income was higher than a year ago for the first time in eight years, which boosted liquidity and loan repayment capacity and provided renewed support for farm real estate. Overall, they said agricultural conditions in the first quarter of 2021 in the Kansas City Fed region were poised to remain strong for the first time since 2013. The EPA's oversight of state Section 24C labels is poorly managed, risky to the public and environment, and needs an overhaul. That's according to that agency's inspector general in a report issued this week. That report could have implications for farmers, for pesticide applicators, and state regulators who often rely on these types of pesticide labels, also known as special local needs labels, to address local environmental or pest problems. The EPA's office Office of the Inspector General urges the agency to make major changes in its oversight of those Section 24C labels. Section 24C has come under scrutiny lately because several states have used them to further restrict federal dicamba labels in the past few years. More recently, the EPA announced it will no longer permit this kind of restrictive state special local needs label. Will these high wheat prices finally cause producers to reverse the long-term trend of lower and lower wheat plantings? The USDA's Gary Crawford takes a look. Lots of speculation right now on what's going to happen to wheat acreage this next season, given the very strong prices of late. Last year's average price was four fifty eight a bushel. This week, prices are well over $6. Last year, U.S. wheat growers planted the lowest acreage ever. Now, we asked USDA Outlook Chairman Mark Jekanowski if we might see a reversal of that long-term trend toward fewer wheat acres. It gets hard to talk about implications for wheat acreage, given that prices for commodities that have you know competing uses of that land are also up pretty strongly as well. And he says the decision on planting can involve much more than just the price. So um, it's still always going to come down to whatever crops that individual farmers are most competitive at to, based on their expertise, based on their land characteristics, etc. And yes, also based on the price at planting time and the price forecast for harvest time. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A Kansas farmer and national wheat trade leader recently shared an update on the wheat industry with the Kansas legislature. And during that testimony, he reported on several positive things going on on behalf of wheat producers and the state's agricultural sector. Marsha Boswell has more on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? Brian Lennon, past chairman of the Kansas Wheat Commission, shared success stories related to exports, consumer outreach, research, and more in testimony to the Kansas legislature. Research remains the central focus of the Kansas Wheat Commission. The organization recently celebrated seven years in the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center, which was funded by farmers through the wheat assessment and now includes 37,000 square feet of laboratory and greenhouse space and a dozen full and part-time plant scientists. The commission also invested more than $1.3 million in research proposals for work that will help wheat farmers increase and improve profitability, plus ensure the quality and integrity of Kansas-grown wheat to end-users and consumers. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center also houses a test kitchen, and the Kansas Wheat Commission employs a full-time nutrition educator, both pieces of the organization's nutrition education efforts. 
Kansas wheat also belongs to two national consumer education organizations, the Wheat Foods Council and the Home Baking Association. Average monthly traffic to the commission's Eat Wheat virtual campaign now totals nearly 65,000 visitors, boosted by COVID-19 pandemic consumer trends related to bread baking and cooking at home. Through Eat Wheat, the Kansas Wheat Commission shares farming practices and showcases the story of the American wheat farmer through recipes, crafts, and profile stories. The Eat Wheat campaign reaches consumers within the United States, but the Kansas Wheat Commission also promotes Kansas hard bread winter wheat to international end users through a partnership with U.S. Wheat Associates. Kansas farmers export roughly half of their wheat crop each year. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Kansas Wheat Commission and market development partner U.S. Wheat Associates switched from in-person programming to virtual trade teams and crop quality seminars. Kansas Wheat also works closely with the IGP Institute to provide additional educational opportunities for domestic and international milling groups grain buyers, and farmers. As a result of these activities and market dynamics, hard red winter wheat exports ended the year up 8% from the prior year at 374 million bushels. Top customers, Mexico, Nigeria, and Japan, continue to be steady buyers of hard red winter wheat, while Latin America had a nearly 20% increase in wheat imports. Lenin said because of the importance of exports, Trade issues have been on the forefront of our efforts over the past year. Lenin chairs the Joint International Trade Policy Committee for U.S. Wheat Associates and the National Association of Wheat Growers. He said we believe it is in the best interests of wheat farmers to renegotiate trade agreements and maintain relationships with our international customers. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. Kansas Agricultural Weather is next. You're listening to Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Finishing out this agriculture today, we welcome back in once more climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, for our weekly visit on Kansas agricultural weather. This cold is nothing new for Kansans, Mary. That is definite. It's the duration of the cold that's, well, less common. Right. Um, We'll be checking to see just how long of a record we will set on it. But I did look at some numbers earlier for Manhattan, and we have had some fairly cold spells. 1983 would be one that would come into mind where we had like 10 days where the temperature never got above 10 degrees. So it's been cold in the past, but we have had a fairly mild winter up to this point. Both December and January were warmer than average. So the cold that we've experienced so far this week and that we're expecting into next week is certainly a shock to the system, if you will. And this is the product of what's going on weather-wise? Well, basically, there's a blocking pattern in the polar regions that is sending the Arctic air down into the center of the country. They call it a polar vortex. And that is penetrating all the way down obviously into Kansas, but it's making its way all the way down to the Gulf Coast. As we've seen in the news the last couple of days, there have been ice events in Texas and into Arkansas. We've been on the drier side of that. When you get these Arctic air masses in place, they tend to be very, very dry, and so that will minimize the chance of an icing event here in Kansas. However, as we remind people on a regular basis, it doesn't take much of that freezing drizzle to cause a problem. So be cautious. We are expecting a chance of precipitation through the weekend into early next week. Most of the um, forecasts are calling for it all to be snow, but again, it's very likely to be fine powdery snow. 
the water equivalents that they've been talking about in this event is 25 to 1. In other words, 25 inches of snow to one inch of water. And we're not anticipating seeing anything Hmm. like that amount of snow. Let's hope not. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that the quantitative precip forecast is calling for generally less than a half an inch across the state with the heaviest amounts right over the border into Oklahoma. So not huge amounts at this time of the year. We would expect about a quarter of an inch in parts of eastern and central Kansas and less than that on average for the week in western Kansas. As we move later into February and enter into March, we're Um, gradually ramping up on what we would expect on a daily basis or a weekly basis. But at this point, we're still in our drier time of the year. The main feature, though, of course, is the deep, deep freeze we have. In that we've had day upon day of ultra-cold weather here, you and the folks at the Mesonet program have uh, put together a new informational tool that folks can use to track exactly what's going on. That'll debut on Monday? Yes, and... We are anticipating, barring any issues with the um, networks, which is always Hmm. a challenge, an improvement on our freeze monitoring tool. So if you go to the freeze monitor, what we're looking at is upgrading the capacity. So instead of just seeing the last 24 hours below freezing or below 24, you'd be able to see as much as a week of time below that 24 and 32 We're also looking and anticipating having the ability to set a threshold that you could look at for that cold. So if, for example, you're looking at wheat production and 12 degrees Fahrenheit is the critical temperature, you could see how many hours that site is below 12 degrees, not just the 32 or the 24. So check that out. Um, Look at our freeze monitor page on the mesonet.ksu.edu. And feel free to let us know what you think of that and whether or not you find that useful. Excellent. Looking for that coming Monday. And there, here and now, still the Animal Comfort Index. We all understand how these conditions have been potentially brutal on livestock outdoors. Right. And there you can get a snapshot across the region of what the current conditions are. But you can drill down on the page and do a chart that shows how that has played out over the last week as well. And looking at that, we've seen quite a bit of time where it's been in that moderate to severe and even extreme danger level. And unfortunately, it looks like the worst of the cold, at least in the eastern part of the state, will show up this weekend. We're looking at low temperatures um, in the negative teens, maybe as cold as minus 20. But the really brutal factor will be that that we're expecting some fairly strong winds to accompany those very cold temperatures. And of course, that will have a negative impact on the livestock. Needless to say, take all precautions possible to protect livestock in these conditions now and most assuredly into the early part of next week. And by the way, listeners, on Monday's broadcast, we'll have on board K-State beef veterinarian A.J. Tarpoff to talk over response to and prevention of hypothermia in cattle, particularly those newborn beef calves. When will we exit these freezing temperatures, though? Well, optimistically, we're looking at Thursday or Friday of next week that we will rebound a little bit into those temperatures. They're still likely to be cooler than normal, but we're going to get into the 30s, maybe into the 40s, and that will be a welcome relief to the cold snap that we've endured at this point. And you say that the general outlook moving into spring remains warmer? At this point, it continues to favor warmer and drier than normal for the February, March, April time frame. That will be updated next Thursday. So if they come back and listen to us next Friday, we'll have the latest on what the spring outlook might bring for us. One other precaution we would remind producers is that We've now seen ice on both uh, the ponds and the rivers because of that cold temperature. Don't be deceived by the conditions that ice is not stable, and it can be very, very dangerous. Take 
precautions aplenty as we work our way through this current system. Mary, stay warm. Have a good weekend. Many thanks. Thanks, Eric. Climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, again, take full advantage of those sources of information on the mezzanet.ksu.edu website. And a good weekend to you. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.